If you're a fish breeder, one of the problems that you might run into is struggling to get egg scatterers or other kind of egg laying fish to get really successful hatch rates on your fish. Maybe it's you keep seeing fungus problems. Maybe you just don't see eggs hatching. Whatever that may be, let's talk about a couple of tips on how to prevent this in the future and what kind of problems you might be dealing with based on your own aquarium. Hello everyone, this is Bentley. And we're gonna talk about eggs a little bit. I know what you're gonna think, right? Bentley, you ain't really bred any fish in a while. What do you know? Well, I recently had a conversation with one of my fish mentors and I would argue heroes, Gary Lang. Uh, he reached out to me asking a couple of questions specifically about a piece of equipment, a Zis egg tumbler. I asked him like, a couple of questions because while I don't actively breed a lot of fish right now, other than the guppy project that's down here, which is going really well, I've got like two full huge batches of fry in there. There's tiny, teeny, tiny little babies. It's great. But I, I asked him a few simple questions. Gary obviously knows what he's doing. He's been doing this longer than... Well, longer. <laughs> He's been doing it for a while. It was some simple questions I wanted to ask because sometimes, you know, when we bounce our ideas off of fellow hobbyists, the friend that we're reaching out to, even if they don't necessarily have more experience than us, might come up with an idea that we overlooked or didn't think about. Gary was having this problem with a particular type of pseudomagill egg, which is basically that he was getting really low hatch rates. And it kind of put me down this path of thinking about some things. Now, granted, every problem that I could necessarily think of are things that he's already thought of. Let's be honest here. I thought this was a great opportunity after having that conversation with Gary to kind of talk about this topic for all of us out there and try to spread a few tips. So tip number one, egg fungus. If you're having fungus on your eggs, that means they're they're turning like white and they might even get a little fuzzy uh, and they're definitely not getting to the point of where they're eyed up. And for those of you that have been uh, researching how to breed egg, lay egg scatterers, egg layers, etc., you, you kind of understand what eyed up means. If that's your problem, if you're getting a lot of eggs turning white and they don't stay clear the whole time, this is almost always fungus. There's a number of different ways to attack fungus. One of the easiest ways is the natural way. Catapa leaves. Catapa leaves, when they start slowly decaying in the water, produce tannins. Tannins are a natural antifungal. So for a lot of people who breed Corydoras, uh, maybe some types of Plecos, etc., this is kind of a common trick. If you're running into problems with hatching, is to add a fresh catapa leaf to whichever container you're keeping your eggs in, uh, assuming that you keep them in a separate container and you don't keep them with the parents, which is one of the key things. Most of this is for artificial hatching. I'm going to be very clear here. So that will allow these to slowly break down. They add tannins to the water, and those tannins act as a natural shield and protectorant against those eggs getting fungus. But there's more than one option than just catapa leaves. Alder cones. Now I've got a number of them here. This handy dandy little cup. But this little guy right here, whoop, this is an alder cone. Alder cones are another fantastic source of tannins. These are very common for shrimp breeders, honestly. A lot of shrimp breeders like to use them. Alder cones are very simple. You give them a light rinse, put them in your tank, let them do their thing. And you really don't need much. Like seriously, if you were doing a small tray of say, Corydora eggs or Tetra eggs, maybe even rainbow fish eggs, you don't even need this many. You could probably do it with just one. Pretty handy, right? And these are relatively cheap. There's all sorts of different botanical sellers that have them. If you go to local fish swaps, you'll probably find somebody that has alder cones near their home that they collect regularly and sell. Just rinse them off lightly, give them a nice light wash. Don't soak them necessarily. Unless you are concerned that you don't know the source, then what you could do is basically do a very light parboil. So that's just getting the water up to a boil and then putting them in for maybe like a minute. Not super long, just enough so that that boiling water can basically kill any potential things. And then you can pull them out, dry them off, or honestly, just kind of leave them wet, give them a little light shake off, maybe even a little rinse. And you can put them into your tank, your container, whichever you're doing your raising in. You'll see the water go tannined up pretty fast with alder cones. That's why, in general, I would say if you are doing alder cones and you have a small container, use like one. I mean, really do not use a whole ton of them. Kind of feel it out and get used to with your particular container size. 
how much you need. It's going to take a little practice, kind of like a top of leaves. Usually just one whole leaf does the trick, but if you have a larger container or you're doing a larger tank, you might need multiple. The last tip in antifungals, because there's a number of different tannin bearing things that we can put in there, all sorts of different leaves, but these are the two most common and most effective typically. But one of the last things we could do is a trick that is very similar to what Master Breeder Dean does. Master Breeder Dean often has small containers that he puts eggs in, and he will put a singular drop of methylene blue into something like a large specimen container if you want to get an equivalent, or, or even I've seen a lot of breeders use like old food containers, like this extreme jumbo container right here. Uh, once they empty it out, they give it a nice cleaning and they will use this with an airline to hatch their eggs. Handy, recycling things that we have lying around the house. Really, really easy if you're breeding lots and lots of fish. A single drop is usually enough, even in a container that size. But if you're having trouble getting methylene blue or you have a number of different species that are at a higher risk of methylene blue actually causing uh, sterility or potentially making it so the fish never hatch. You can also use a more commonly available thing like ICX. While ICX is normally used to treat ick, as the name would imply, it also does a pretty good job with a very low dose, similar to methylene blue, where it's only a drop or two of preventing fungus on eggs. I have seen some folks use Prazipro, which is mostly Praziquantanol, to try and do a similar thing. But realistically, if you can, some of the more natural ways tend to be a little more effective. So that covers fungus. Let's talk about the next problem, hardening of the outside shell of the egg to where the baby fish can't break free, sometimes referred to as calcification. If you live in an area where you have particularly hard water, or maybe you have a higher level of calcium and magnesium naturally in your water, one thing that can occur with a number of fish species that lived in softer water is that those extra mineral contents can harden the outer shell, right, that membrane around the egg. And it can get to a point of where when the baby fish reaches maturity and is going to break free, they're unable to because the egg is too hard. This can be really tough as a number of people will use various water softening techniques, including using things like tannins, to help bring the water down and make it a little more simple. But some of the ways that you can fix this outside of just tannins is to cut your water with a mix of distilled and or reverse osmosis water to drastically bring down the number of dissolved solids, specifically your general hardness type things, calcium and magnesium, out of the water to prevent those extra minerals and nutrients from being absorbed by the eggshell and hardening it. This can be a little more difficult. I want to be very clear. And it can be really frustrating to figure out the right mix. But what I would say is something like a basic TDS tester, a digital one that you can buy on Amazon, is going to be a really good way to do a baseline and do some experiments. Now, a lot of people will prefer to use more accurate test methods, like specifically looking at calcium testing, magnesium, general hardness testing. My general philosophy is if you can bring your TDS down, because certain species of fish will have trouble even at something like 120 to 130 TDS of general hardness. This is actually something very similar to which uh, Gary's water parameters are. I was talking to him about this and I was asking if we were, if maybe one of the problems is a calcification, but he had talked about a number of different things he was doing to prevent that. So probably not the problem, but it is still something to watch out for, especially if you live in like the areas that we love to jokingly refer to as liquid rock and you're not breeding a fish that naturally comes from a very hard water area like African cichlids, then you might want to consider doing some level of cutting down of your water to make it significantly softer and less mineral rich. Things like Corydoras tend to have this problem. A number of your different like Amazonian egg scatterers can run into this and some species of rainbows will run into this. And there's a lot more, don't get me wrong. This is not the entirety of the list. Those are just the ones I can think of off the very top of my head. Let's say, it's not a hardness issue, and you're not dealing with fungus in. You're, you're dealing with some other problem. A number of really, 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 really expert people in the world have suggested that sometimes when the chlorides become a little too high in the water, that can also bring that similar hardening of the egg or calcification process. While this is not calcium and thus calcification, it is a hardening. So sometimes it can behoove us if we naturally have a slightly higher level of chlorides in our water or even potentially fluorides, to go about finding a way to cut that down. Whole home water filters can do a really good job. Again, 
cutting things down significantly with distilled or reverse osmosis water will help you here. But trying to remove some of those chemicals can help prevent the hardening of the eggshell. Uh, fluoride is literally there to help with enamel on our teeth. Right? These are these things that we use to destroy things constantly. So if you think about it, if you have a reasonable amount of fluoride in your water, this might be helping build a layer of unbreakable shell for those poor little baby fish. Lastly, water flow. This is where one of the theories comes and you'll see a number of different things, whether it's like the German breeding ring or a breeder box, Dean's fry method, right? Where he's got a constant drip of water going into flat, shallow trays. There's a number of really awesome 3D printed ones that are on Etsy based on that philosophy that are really, really great, to be honest. Using that water flow can help prevent a number of things because if we think about like plecos, angelfish, discus, and a lot of our types of fish that put eggs in a certain area and stay and guard them, you'll notice they kind of constantly fan their fins. They're helping move water constantly because moving water is less likely to cause fungus, calcification, other kind of parasitic issues, all kinds of things that would naturally prevent the eggs from hatching. So if we mimic that with an egg tumbler for some of your more uh, durable eggs, maybe in softer eggs, we use some of the trays or something like that, some kind of light artificial water movement that can help take something like a 50 or lower percent hatch rate and almost all the way to 100%. This is a really, really effective method because if we think about a number of the fish that are out there in nature, when they're protecting their eggs, they're constantly moving water over those eggs. If nature is doing it, there's a reason. So adding water flow in some way, shape or form, and granted, this is very minor. We don't need like rushing rapids going over our eggs, right? Because those poor little fry, when they hatch, they're not that strong. If we are seeing some of these issues and maybe some of the other things aren't helping us, we might consider using something like an egg tumbler, a breeding box, any way that can get us a consistent, relaxed level of water flow directly through where the eggs are sitting can help us prevent a number of the problems and increase those hatch rates. The last thing I want to give you is basic parameters. Make sure your temperature, you've got good oxygenation, and all the usual things that we would do for most of the actual fish that are laying those eggs. Make sure we're mimicking a similar level or potentially even slightly higher to help protect those eggs. As an example, rainbow fish in general, they like a pretty wide range of temperatures, but when we're hatching eggs and raising young fry, we like to go a little higher on the temperature. While this might expose us to a slightly higher risk of bacteria issues, we can counteract that by good water parameters. There's four tips to help you have more success if you are struggling to get really high hatch rates with your egg scatterers and egg laying fish. If you've enjoyed this video, please, please, please consider subscribing, give it a like. It's one of the best ways to help Papa YouTube know that you enjoy this content and someone else might too, and it's completely free. If there's something you've learned from this that you haven't done, or maybe you've got a secret, super secret technique that you wanna share with the world, leave it in the comments down below. As always, my friends, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome.